Hi, folks. We are honored to be joined by United States Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Congresswoman, good to see you. Nice seeing you. Thanks for having me. As always. Let me ask you this. Your colleague uh, from California, Katie Porter, Congresswoman Katie Porter, has written a book, and I know you know the book. It's called, I Swear, Politics is Messier Than My Minivan. How messy is politics these days, 2023 in D.C. and Congress? You know, that's a really interesting question because I was just speaking to someone who was a chief of staff in the 70s when he felt that politics worked a lot better, when Congress worked a lot better. He said it was messier. He said members of Congress were less busy, but that passing legislation was actually messier, uh, which I found very interesting. I think what we have today, though, is people have a great deal more insight into how we pass legislation than they did in the 70s. Along those lines, a whole range of critical issues, inflation, uh, concerns about a re recession. Ukraine, you've been very involved, very committed, and very clear on where you stand on this. Where do we as a country need to stand, particularly given your background in military service and understanding these issues from a perspective that most of us who have never served do not? Where do we need to stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine? Well, that's exactly where we need to stand, shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Um, one of the, the great leadership uh, moments of the United States of America was coalescing our democratic allies in NATO. And that really ensured that until 2014, we hadn't seen a nation um, overtaking the sovereignty of another nation in, in Europe, which was really amazing because the United States, the world had been drawn into endless cycles of war um, originating in Western Europe. And that ended that effectively for many, many decades. Unfortunately, with the encroachment of Russia into Ukraine um, and the nations around the world watching carefully, other would-be autocrats or, or nations that would like to take over the sovereign territory of other regions, they are watching this very, very closely. So it is imperative that uh, Ukraine win this and that Russia understand at the end of this that this was a huge mistake and they cannot continue to do this. They can't you know, take a period of time off uh, as they did after 2014, reassess and then come back and do this again. We need to make sure that we can build a lasting peace after this. Congressman, follow up on that real quick before we move to immigration. The biggest difference in terms of our national policy as it relates to the, the war in Ukraine and its inter our interaction with Russia and, and Vladimir Putin between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is? Well, I think what you see is Donald Trump, and this was one of my great concerns about his presidency, and as you probably know, I had many concerns, but this one, I think, really was shaking some of the foundations of our relationships around the world, is Donald Trump was far more attracted to autocrats like Putin, like she, um, very impressed when she became president for life. You could probably see in some of that the idea that he would try to carry out on January 6th when he tried to stay in office. So I think it was very dangerous that he was forming closer relationships with people uh, and countries that stood contrary to our values and pushing aside those key democracies that have stood with us so many times over the last several decades since World War II in promoting democratic values across the world. President Biden has not done that. In fact, I will tell you, before my first trip to Kyiv in the weeks leading up, it was about a week and a half before the war started, um, I went to Kyiv. We spoke to President Zelensky. We stopped in Brussels on the way there, and I spoke with our NATO allies in Brussels. The sense of relief was palpable that the United States was ready to lead again. We are the key leader in NATO. And you could tell that our NATO allies were very relieved to have us back and then very willing to coalesce behind our leadership to support Ukraine. I want to get to immigration in a second, but the Jersey Strong agenda, dealing with the SALT deduction, saving SALT deduction, taking care of veterans and dealing with auto thefts, um, optimizing women's health care, nominating more labor representatives, getting, quote, stuff done. Question. We have an initiative called Reimagine Child Care. The website will be up. Where does child care, affordable, accessible child care fit into this Jersey strong agenda? 
The Jersey Strong agenda is based on what I hear directly from my constituents. So of course, childcare is enmeshed in that. I have to tell you that I, my oldest is 17 years old. And I still remember 17 years ago, desperately trying to find childcare somewhere that was safe and affordable. And it, it turned out I found somewhere that was safe, but certainly I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't call it affordable because I was paying my entire paycheck at different times into childcare. That has not changed. It's grown worse for working families today. In fact, um, a single parent pays about the median income pays about 40% of that income in childcare, that's unacceptable. And that's why I've put together legislation um, that would result in no one paying more than 7% of their income in childcare. So that would take a family earning $130,000 down from over $2,000 a month to about $200 a month. By the way, go on the Congresswoman's website to find out more about her policy initiatives. Real quick on this, not that it's a real quick subject, um, American immigration policy. What exactly do you believe we need to be doing as a country on the southern border? You know, I believe we need to do uh, what I've been talking about for years now and come up with a comprehensive solution. And I think we are now closer to that. I wouldn't say we are close to that. We are closer to that than we've been in five years. We've seen bipartisan efforts those are continuing to build. My friend, Veronica Escobar, who I sit on the House Armed Services Committee with, is working with Maria Salazar and the Republican Party to come together on what we can do to address security at our southern border, to make sure we have a pathway to citizenship for people who are here, to address um, international criminal syndicates in South and Central America, um, the things we need to do to make sure that we have a more fair immigration system and also uh, protect uh, what comes in and out of our, our borders. Because at our southern border, at many of our ports, we are seeing an uptick in fentanyl from China that is really devastating here in this country. Congressman, shift gears dramatically. The Chips and Science Act, what the heck does it have to do with semiconductors? And what do semiconductors have to do with inflation in our economy, please? Sure. So as as everyone's aware, our supply chains were really put in danger over COVID, and we were seeing huge problems getting these semiconductor chips. Um, and so that's why you see the pictures of Ford F-150s on the tarmac in Michigan. We simply couldn't have those chips, which run so many things across our economy. What the Chips and Science Act is doing is reshoring American manufacturing, especially in those very high-end chips. So while semiconductor chips come from all over the world, the very high-end semiconductor chips are very tightly controlled. Um, there are very few people uh, that have the know-how how to make those. And so we are making sure that not only do we produce them here, but we also are making sure that we can control that technology because we have learned in you know, we just can't trust China in some of these national security spaces to be good partners. We've seen too much technology transfer, forced technology transfer, too much espionage, IP theft. So that's why we are fencing off certain national security areas where we will only produce those with trusted partners. And much of that we are now reshoring home to produce those here in this country. You've been listening to United States Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill happens to be the member of Congress who represents the community I live in. And um, I, we appreciate you joining us, Congresswoman, and we'll continue the conversation with you in the future. And while we're not a political program that does political prognostication or horse racing or what's coming up in a future election, I just want to disclose that there are a fair number of people who talk about the Congresswoman as a potential candidate for governor in the great state of New Jersey in 2025. Doesn't feel that far off. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Steve Adubaro. That's the Congresswoman. See you next time. I am alive today thanks to my kidney donor. I am traveling and more active than ever before. I'm alive today thanks to my heart donor. I'm full of energy and back singing in my church choir. I'm alive today thanks to my lung donor. I'm breathing easy and I'm enjoying life's precious moments. There are about 4,000 people in the years who are waiting for a life-saving transplant. Donation needs diversity. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit njsharingnetwork.org.
Also brought to you by the Terrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care. New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT, makes industry-ready professionals in all STEM fields. New Jersey Sharing Network, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, here when you need us most. IBEW Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Operating Engineers, Local 825, The Fidelco Group, Veolia, Resourcing the World, and by Holy Name. This place is different.